afternoon. Um, the day after big day, campaigns uh, finally uh, over for phase one. Uh, now let the real games begin and the money really starts to flow. I can't hardly believe it. Do you realize that here in the state of Alaska, there are more dollars being spent on a United States Senate race than in any other state in the nation. Thirty million dollars. I don't know about you, but I think that's wrong. Um, I'm all about free speech, but it just seems wrong. I'm trying to get a few million dollars here and there to help with water and sewer. We're trying to get a, a, a bank stabilization going on here in the Kenai that might make a difference for this community. I can't tell you what we could do with this kind of money. But that is a major aside. I just had to throw that out to you here today. I want to recognize, um, before I begin my, my comments, a few people that uh, I'm just really pleased to see here today. First, I want to acknowledge um, the Shadura family. You know, I've known Paul for a long, long time. It's nice to see your whole family here. But you mentioned the roots, the roots that um, really make us who we are as, as a community. And, and your family has truly been leaders within the community. Uh, I respect that, and it was great to have the acknowledgement from Senator Machiki as well as the speaker here today. I want to congratulate those who have made it successfully through your your primary races. I know Mike Chenault was just sweating it over there. And, uh, and, and to all those uh, who serve in elected office, whether it's Senator Machiki, Speaker Chenault, I don't see Kurt Olson here today. Uh, we have a lot of assembly people, folks that uh, are seeking the assembly. Thank you for what you do, putting yourself out there, uh, representing your community, representing um, uh, your, your, your friends um, on issues that are important at the local, at the state, and, and at all different levels. Uh, I also want to give a special shout out to a young man who spent the summer with me back in Washington, D.C., Ben Gilman uh, at the front table here. Uh, I was able to, to pluck Ben out of, of a great summer here on the peninsula and had him running my intern program back in Washington, D.C. He did a great job for me. He represented your community very well. He was a great ambassador for Alaska. So Ben, thank you. We appreciate it. Him. And another shout out to a local, she's not here this afternoon, but Layla Kimbrell um, is a young woman from the peninsula here, born and raised. And I was at Industry Appreciation about three years or so ago, and I ran into Layla. Uh, she went to the same law school that I did, and I said, what are you doing, Layla? And she said, you know, I'm working as an attorney in Anchorage. And I said, you need to come back to Washington, D.C. with me. She says, really? Long story short, it took her about uh, a month and a half to move herself and her boyfriend back to Washington, D.C. She has taken over the easy portfolio for me. She handles the economy and taxes, but one of your own. And she is doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job for, for us um, as Alaskans back in Washington, D.C. And I get to not only enjoy Industry Appreciation Day coming up on Saturday, but also her wedding out uh, at her grandparents' uh, place. So um, you should be proud of the young men and young women that you are raising here on the peninsula. They're a true tribute, and I think they really do speak to the roots that Paul Shadura spoke to. I, uh, I want to... Uh, give what has been promised, which is a little bit of the Washington, D.C. Um, uh, news, as well as give a little commentary on, on politics, because we're all thinking about politics at this time of year. But let me, let me start by just a quick D.C. update. We are, we are midway through this August they call it a recess, it's a work period, call it whatever you want. All I know is that school started for y'all here, 
you ask a school kid what recess is, they'll tell you. It's not the same thing that we do. Um, we work at our tail off, but it's an opportunity to be here in the state for five or six weeks, um, which is great because it allows me to get all over the state during that time period. It's also great to be on the same time zone for more than four or five days in a row, so that, uh, that helps. But I have, um, in just the, the two weeks that we've been out now, I've been to Ketchikan and Haines and Fairbanks and Valdez and I can't remember where else I've been. Um, China, Kodiak, I don't know, you don't care. I've been all over the state. And the good news is, is that there's so much more to come. I'm going to be able to be out in the interior. Uh, I had the secretary of the, of the energy department uh, with me this past weekend looking at energy issues, both fossil and renewable, uh, as we were up there. I was with the commandant of the Coast Guard, the new commandant. We were down in Ketchikan, out in Kodiak, dedicating some Coast Guard housing. There's a lot going on, and it was a good opportunity to spend a little bit of time educating some folks there. So important that we have the time on the ground here to, to really see w what, what is happening, how we can best facilitate back in Washington, D.C., um, some of the, the, the issues con and concerns at the local level. We, despite what you have read in the, in the news about the Washington, D.C. gridlock, um, that, in fact, is alive. I wish it weren't. It has, it has been extraordinarily frustrating as we have some pretty weighty issues in front of us, how we deal with our debt, uh, what I happen to believe is a, is a, is a foreign policy um, from this administration that has just fallen flat on its face. Uh, we've got immigration issues that we have to deal with. We've got tax reform that we have to deal with. We have appropriations bills that have yet to be addressed. We got a lot to do. The reason that you're not seeing things happen is not because there's nothing to do. It's because we've gotten so entrenched with the partisan nature of what is happening in, in the Congress, particularly in the Senate, you're not seeing a lot of productivity. And that hurts us as a nation, because we're not governing when we're not being productive. We've had a breakdown in, in process. And I know most people don't really care about the process, you just want us to get some things done. But the fact of the matter is, is that when the process doesn't allow you to have participation as a minority party, and that's exactly what we're talking about here, when you don't have bills that go through committee, when you don't have an opportunity to, to either introduce or vote on or debate amendments, when you have an up or down vote on a major piece of legislation, and you're not given an opportunity to weigh in, it's pretty tough to say, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just accept that as an as a article of, of trust and faith. You don't do it. You wouldn't do it. And you shouldn't expect your member of Congress to do it. Since July last year to July of this year, there have been 14 Republican amendments that we were allowed to have a vote on. 14 in a year. Now you might say, well that's not very good, and they shouldn't do that to the Republicans. But the fact of the matter is, is the majority leader is doing it to the Democrats too. The Democrats have only had nine votes. So you have members, members in the Senate who have been there their whole time, who have never had the opportunity to have one of their amendments voted on. Now, Senator Machicki's here. He, he leads these committees. If you were to suggest to your colleagues that what we're gonna do is we're gonna bypass the committee, you just gotta trust me. I'm gonna put together a great bill. It's gonna solve all of our oil and gas problems. We, I, I'm gonna do it myself, just trust me. There's not gonna be any committee process. You've got one member in charge, and then you bring it to the floor, and nobody is allowed to introduce an amendment. I think that they would run your senator out of town. Fortunately, 
he's smarter than that, and he knows that he wouldn't do that. Although, you know, you could probably you handle this on your own, couldn't you, Peter? I was going to ask what you heard. <laughs> <laughs> you got a good one there. Keep him. But uh, that's, that's kind of the process that we are in. Now, as I unload on you with that, keep in mind that we have seen some, some items progress to, uh, to full passage and <coughs> signature into law. The Water Resources Development Authorization, the WERDA bill, very important for us here in Alaska. It authorizes the Army Corps of Engineers to work infrastructure projects. I mentioned the, the bank stabilization project here in Kenai. This is going to be very important for us going forward, and, and with WERDA uh, passing, that, that's helpful. Um, we had the Workforce Investment, or excuse me, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This is this is something that you would think ought to be pretty simple. When you've got a, a slow economy and we need to get more jobs moving, a Workforce Opportunity Act it took us eight years to get to it. We finally did reach a resolve, and that has been um, put into place. It, it effectively authorizes key. Um, employment some training programs as we're, as we're getting people back to work. We resolved the Homeowner Flood Insurance uh, Affordability Act. This puts pressure on FEMA to correct what was some really egregious errors with, um, with flood zone maps that was causing huge increases in flood insurance to folks. So uh, we were able to address that. We put a temporary patch, a 10-month patch, for the Highway Trust Fund that takes us through May uh, of next year to ensure that states are able to move forward on their road construction projects. I don't know about you, but every town I have been in in Alaska this season, the, uh, the, the biggest sign of progress are these orange cones everywhere. They drive us all crazy. But what it does demonstrate is that we do have some good, good road projects underway. We want to keep them moving. So it was important that we have that. We also passed and was signed into law a reform package for the Veterans Affairs Administration to improve access for our veterans to, to timely and adequate health service. I think you all saw the, the, the focus uh, from the media on what was happening within the VA. Uh, unnecessarily long waits, um, I mean horribly, uh, ineffective in, in their systems control and process. And so a lot of spotlight on making sure that our veterans have timely access. So what we have done with this reform um, measure is said, if you can't get an appointment within 30 days, if you live more than 40 miles from a VA facility, which is pretty much everywhere in Alaska, then you can go out on the community to purchase your care, and that will the provider will be reimbursed by VA. Couple stipulations to that, though, you can't just go to any provider. It has to be a provider that uh, uh, accepts Medicare. Well, for us in Alaska, that's a real limitation because we don't have enough providers that accept Medicare. So that's a limitation. But one of the other areas that you can seek your care is through our federally qualified health centers. So that's an option and an avenue for us down here on the peninsula. Uh, and then uh, the third area is through our IHS facilities. Now in the lower 48, um, the, the, uh, the IHS facilities are, are nothing to write home about. In fact, in, in many areas, they are very, very troubled. But here in Alaska, I think we've got some good, strong systems. We've been, I've been working for years to break down the silos between our federal agencies. If you have a native veteran, why shouldn't he or she be able to get the care closest to, to their home where they want to be, rather than having to, to come into Anchorage for VA care? So we've made some real progress there. I think that that's important. We are not done yet with reform, though, when it comes to the VA, because as we focus on, on more timely care, we have to keep in mind, we, we can't lose sight of the coordination of care. For those of you who are veterans or have family members who are vets, you know that if you go to the VA, 
your records are all there. Everybody knows what prescription drugs you're taking, what treatment you're doing, the doc that you're seeing, and they, they, they kind of have the whole picture of you. But if you're now going out on the community and you're going to one doc for, for, for your heart and another for uh, uh, mental health, do the two doctors, are they really talking in terms of, of what medications you're on? Are they really talking in terms of what's happening to, to, the, to the whole coordinated care? So this is something that we have got to keep.